anytime anybody says they want something. That's actually a negotiation. The scene unfolding yesterday was like one from a movie or a nightmare. What a day this story that hostage standoff in Chase Manhattan Bank. Oh my God, what's going on? Of course, not only the New York City hostage negotiating team, but also the FBI's hostage negotiating team has joined them. With us now to help break down the investigation, FBI Special Agent Hostage Negotiator, Christopher Voss. Today I can't believe my eyes. When we set out on this podcast journey, we said we wanted to have someone on the podcast. We tried our best. Chris Voss is here with us now. I'm speaking to Chris Voss, hostage negotiator for the FBI. Finally today, we've made it possible. We're joined by Chris Voss. Thanks for finally letting me come up. How can you mirror bringing the power of silence? What is negotiation? How do I know that you even know what the hell's going on? How do you challenge somebody without confronting them? I'm a cold calling salesperson. I am unwell. What's the neuroscience behind that? The best way to deactivate a negative is not to deny it, but to call it out. I love that. So how do you use a label to get deeper and talk about the things that aren't being Said. It's going to sound harsh. You're not going to like what I had to say. What persuaded the government finally to come out? I think it was excellent hostage negotiating. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the We Have a Meeting podcast. Today, I can't believe my eyes. When we set out on this podcast journey, we said we wanted to have someone on the podcast. We've tried our best. We've had his son on, his whole team, everyone around him. And finally, today, we've made it possible. We're joined by Chris Voss. Chris, how are you? Yeah, I'm fantastic. I'm happy to be here. Thanks thanks for finally letting me come on. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we always start these podcasts off the same way with the same two questions. So who are you and what problem do you solve? Uh, who am I? Uh, it could be <laughs> a deep a philosophical question. What are we all doing here? What's our purpose? Yeah, I'm Chris Voss. I am the author of Never Split the Difference, Negotiating as If Your Life Depended on It. And I solve communication and collaboration challenges. Okay, okay. Um, and I think a lot of people listening, they'll come from all sorts of varied backgrounds. They might be seeing negotiation as something that happens in a hostage situation or in a boardroom. So in layman's terms, if I was explaining it to someone in the pub, what is negotiation? Collaboration. Anytime anybody wants or says they want something, if the words I want or I need are crossing your lips or in the mind of somebody you're talking to, and that's the purpose of the conversation, then you're in a negotiation. Like, it doesn't matter. Most people only think it's when money's at stake. The most common commodity that's there all the time is time. Like if you're trying to get somebody to give you directions, that's information. Take the time to give me directions. If you're trying to get somebody to get you the cup of coffee that you asked for, that's actually a negotiation. I, I heard of Starbucks people that say I give decaf to people who are mean to me. <laughs> so it, it sounds like when I'm trying to get my son to go to bed on time, that's a negotiation. Yeah, if it's a collaboration, if you see it as a collaborative effort and you're trying to get your son to go to bed on time, you're also trying to get him to think. You're trying to get him, you know, your children, a parent's job is to help the kids think. You're trying to help build good habits. I mean, sleep is, is an essential pillar of life and getting your son to recognize that um, in, in a way that it's not, it doesn't seem harsh. It doesn't seem like they're being ordered or punished. You know, these are the challenges. That's collaboration. Yeah. I love it. So, so Chris, we, we run a sales agency, so we do sales for other companies. We, we help implement it in other companies. And if people are listening to this and they're new to sales and they've never heard of you, so they must have been living under a rock, where, where do they start? So we, all of your techniques we, we love and we use them on a daily basis. If somebody was new to sales, what, what should they try and master first? What, what, where would you steer them towards? Well, first of all, the definition of what sales is, um, and I once heard, uh, recently heard Mark Cuban say sales is helping. And in discussing it with my team, you know, we agree sales is helping. Uh, and another member of my team says sales is helping people by shining a light on a problem that they have, that they either knew they had or they didn't even know they had. But, you know, the, first of all, it's got to be helping. 
And secondly, the transition from sales into negotiation. If negotiation is, starts as soon as I want or I need is in somebody's head, then sales is to get them to recognize a want or a need. And helping them solve it is your job as a salesperson. Now, a lot of people don't see it that way. A lot of people see sales as just making a transaction. And, you know, they're not going to last or they're not going to be happy or they're not going to make that much money. Or they're going to come to a point in time in their life where like, I have been helping people. You know, this is immensely um, a, a spiritual less experience. You got to be helping people. So, all right, so now you got that in your head. You're helping. Sales is helping. Be a great sounding board. Uh, the indirect method uh, path to closing a sale, uh, the quickest path is indirect because you want, uh, you want them to pay. You want them to perform. You want them to come back. You want them to re repeat customers. Being very transactional in sales is a guarantee that People are not going to repeat. They feel that they were just a transaction. There's no loyalty. there. They're not going to come back to you. They can't count on you to help them. They're just counting on you to take advantage of them. So the indirect route. On a hostage, uh, on the crisis hotline, which I started at before I became a hostage negotiator, it was a sales, you know, understand people to shine a light on a problem they have and get them to agree to take action. That's the call to action. That's the end of a sales. Mm -hmm. You know, you got a call to action. What's the call to action in, in, in a, a suicide hotline? Get them to take to agree to do something that they will actually implement. So let's say we're going with that analogy. Let's say we buy that. The call to action at the end of a crisis call is the same as a call to action in sales. How long do you think uh, it took to me to get somebody to the call to action on the hotline? 20 minutes or less. Like when I first got there, they told us that if you use empathy correctly, not sympathy, but this helping even challenging approach, your time limit, your time limit's going to be 20 minutes. Not only that, if you do it right, it's going to take less than 20 minutes. Imagine your sales calls maximum 20 minutes. And I remember thinking at the time, you got to be kidding me. In all the movies, people are on the phone with folks for hours. I mean, I'm a big fan of Richard Branson, one of the world's greatest salesmen. And I remember in his book, uh, Losing My Virginity, about his early days, he talks about, you know, he did uh, suicide hotline stuff uh, when, he was, when he was in his just late teens, early 20s. And he'd be talking to people for hours overnight. Well, he hadn't been trained. His heart was in the right place, but he was spending hours in something that should have taken him 20 minutes. Now, I'm going to go back to this challenge idea also, because there's a book out there called The Challenger's Sale. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of great things I like about that book. The principal underlying cornerstone is that the challenger salesperson uh, performs the best under all economic conditions. The best attitude is to be challenging. On a crisis hotline, I had to challenge the caller to act. That was the middle part of it. Establish a relationship, boil down a problem, challenge the call to call it act. The CTA, the call to action, challenge them to act. The challenger so you want to be a challenger. Now, how do you become a challenger? That's when never split the difference comes into play because we give you, my book gives you the emotionally... Uh, emotional intelligence tools to be a challenger. How do you do it in a way where people don't feel attacked? They don't feel cornered. Mm. They feel mentored by you. They feel helped by you. You combine any good sales book with the methodology and never split the difference, you're going to be a hell of a salesperson. So, so much to, to take away from that already, Chris. I think it's it's so interesting. If you can do what you did in 20 minutes on the hotline, then there's no excuse why salespeople can't do a demo or a discovery call in 10, 20 minutes. Everybody needs an hour or two hours. So, so I think that was a, a great takeaway. So I want to, I want to get into those kind of techniques because what, what I hear when I'm with salespeople that they struggle with the, the line from challenging to confrontation. So right. how do you challenge somebody without confronting them? 
Well, it's um, co- confrontation or even assertiveness. If empathy precedes it and you use a great tone of voice, then that's what gets it to land. Empathy's got to precede it. What's empathy? Simply articulating how they see things. Simply articulating the negative aspects of what they see. And the scary thing is getting it out up front as to what negative aspects they might have towards you. That's neuroscience. The neuroscience experiment has been done over and over and over again. The best way to deactivate a negative is not to deny it, but to call it out. We don't say, I don't want you to think that I'm just another salesperson who's trying to just get you to buy. That's a denial. I don't want you to think. How do you switch that into emotional intelligence? Fearless. You say, it probably seems like I'm just another salesperson who just wants you to buy. Going from the denial to the observation. It's just an observation. Neuroscience has shown over and over again that changing it to an observation, calling out the negative, is the best way to deactivate it and keep it deactivated. Even if it doesn't exist yet. One of the things that we found out in the Black Swan Method, what happens if you call out a negative that doesn't yet exist? Is it like the devil is, uh, say the devil and he appears, you know, do you speak the devil into existence? The crazy thing about it is you actually inoculate in advance. And that is scary because everybody's used to the denial of the negative and then having somebody go crazy. I started doing this really as a matter of self-survival. When I'm working kidnappings internationally, I roll into an embassy. They got a kidnapping in a country. I'm sent out from Washington, D.C. I am unwelcome. You know, the self-appointed expert from headquarters is just there to tell us what we're doing wrong. And I'm a threat. Uh, I'm a sales. I'm a cold calling salesperson. I want them to change their methodology. You know, you would think on the outside, they'd welcome experts. Well, that's from the outside. From the inside, it's a message to Washington, D.C. doesn't think they know how to do their job. And I'm there to prove them wrong. They didn't like it at all. Out of sheer survival to get these people to listen to me, before I would say anything, I'd say, this is going to sound harsh. You're not going to like what I have to say. And they'd relax. And they'd listen. I was calling out the negatives in advance. I learned the hard way because I used to show up the first couple of times in an MC. And I just start telling them what to do. Do this, this, and this. And I, Who the hell do you think you are coming here from the outside telling us what to do? And finally, I thought, um, let me try this. This is going to sound harsh. You're not going to like what I have to say. And then I'd say the same thing as before. But instead of them getting offended, since I inoculated them from the negative thoughts, They'd say, nah, that wasn't that harsh. You know, you're just, you're just telling us the truth. So this whole idea of being able to inoculate against negative reactions, I started out as a self-survival mechanism. And now it's actually one of the main cornerstones of strategies that we teach everybody in business and in sales. Inoculate it in advance. Did, did that technique work if you were... Um, so let's say you were taking over from another hostage negotiator and the um, person who had been taking the hostages had been used to someone else. Is that the way you would introduce yourself as I've taken over or is that a totally different tactic that would be required? Well, something really close. I mean, calling out the negatives in advance, the empathy methodology that is, is something we call the accusation zone. Now, something that's really close to it is a summary. And so if I'm taking over and somebody else, the hostage taker or the customer on the other side, what's their first thought? How do I know that you even know what the hell's going on? Like, yeah, yeah, I never heard of you. I don't know if if you have any idea. So if you summarize the situation from the beginning, then what happens is you let them know what you're up to speed on. And one of two things happens. Uh, they're like, wow, this guy does know what's going on. Or they correct you. 
Now, the really counterintuitive thing about being correct is the other side loves it. Like, as human beings, when we get corrected, we're embarrassed. We're horrified. We think we don't look like an expert. We think we look like idiots. That's very self-centered. The person on the other side, when they correct us, they're helping us. So if you're, uh, as a salesperson, taking over from somebody else and you sit down with a customer, client, who, however you refer to them, and you summarize for them, first of all, you're showing them that you're trying to get it right. You're actually indicating to them that you're really coachable and your number one priority is getting it right. And then suddenly, if you're wrong and they correct you, now they're no longer an adversary. They've effectively come around from across the table and they're sitting on your side of the table and they're helping you out. It's a great relationship to be in. So on the handoff, summer, summarization is just an immensely powerful skill. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that we really love about your techniques when we're teaching new salespeople. A lot of them, there is no wrong. Getting it wrong is also getting it right because people will correct you. And if you get it right, then you get the, the that's right response. Um, one of the techniques I wanted to, to get into was uh, labeling and mislabeling. So what I see a lot is maybe in, in conversation, someone's shared that something is frustrating and they've even used the word frustrating. And then the person labels back, that sounds frustrating. And it's almost not, not deep enough. You're just saying the word back. So how do you use a label to get deeper and talk about the things that aren't being said? Well, ask yourself what's causing it. And frustration, what, what's frustration is a result of? It sounds like you've tried some stuff in the past that's failed. Frustration, each negative emotion is set in time, if you will. And you feel frustrated when you're being denied something in the future. It's a negative emotion about something you're trying to get to. Now, anger is about something that happened in the past. You've got a negative emotion about something that has happened to you. Those are two different emotions. The negative emotion is going to start to give you clues as to what's going on with them. What sort of time frame their mind is in the moment and frustration in particular is about where people are trying to go to so you could also label that it sounds like you've tried some stuff that's just not getting you where you want to go that's what frustration tells you that's a deeper level of insight into what they're going through. think about the negative emotion where the trigger for that in their head lies in the past or the future and I, w I really want to pick your brains on on all the different techniques that you talk about, Chris. So one of the one of the big ones is the f bomb, the f word, fair. So yeah. when, when when we start a cold call, we we'll, we I might say, Chris, I'll be honest, it's a sales call. You can hang up or or let me have thirty seconds. So I'm I'm trying to get a, a bit of an accusation audit in there and get it all up front, all the negatives, and then somebody will say well, what's it about? Call me back later. Where did you get my number? And I'll slow it right down. I'll say, great question. Look, let me run through in 30 seconds. And if it's not relevant, we can leave it there. Is that fair? Nine times out of 10, people will go, well, yeah, go on then. Even though they were kind of resistant to start. What, why is the word fair so powerful? And, and where can people be using it more in life, day-to-day -day and sales? Well, uh, human beings uh, have a, a real intense desire to be fair. They want to think of themselves as fair. They want to avoid the accusation of being unfair. Now, that's, using it in that a context is good, but for me personally, I've got to be really careful. Like, first of all, uh, preceding that, the time frame. I'm always, always, always going to ask for slightly more time than I need. Because you're going to love me when I give you time back in your day. Uh, you know, my favorite analogy is like, be the airlines. Like, what the hell is Chris Voss talking about when he says, be the airlines? So probably about 10, 15 years ago or so, you know, on time arrivals with the airlines was really, really important. Is the plane showing up on time? And some airlines are just getting slaughtered if, they get, if the plane doesn't show up on time. So I'm thinking like, all right, you know. Now these airlines are bragging about on-time arrivals. I'm sitting on this one airline one time. We, we landed LAX 
And I'm not going to name the airline. But the pilot, we land, and the pilot says, well, you know, we're 20 minutes early. And because we're early, our gate isn't even ready yet. We're so early. We've done such a great job getting you guys here fast. And the gate's not ready. And so as soon as the gate's ready, we're going to taxi in. And I remember thinking at, at that point in time, like, this airport is stupid. Like, this airplane is really big. They got radar, and they saw us coming from a long way away. So it's ridiculous to think that we showed up by surprise. And then I thought, wait a minute. The airline's lying to us. They had a scheduled time. The airport knew all along when they were going to show up, but they lied to us about it, and they actually changed the time of destination arrival at the other end knowing all along we're going to show up 20 minutes early, but I'm sitting here, who am I mad at, the airline for lying to me or the airport for not letting us get to the gate? Like, so the airline's lying to everybody, and I'm happy as hell with the airline. So they're giving me time back in my day, and it's just a manipulation of the perception. So I never go over a time that I ask on anybody. I always have a really good amount of time that I'm going going to ask for, what and what I need, and I'm only going to ask for slightly more than that. And even if we're having a great conversation, I'm cutting this baby off on time because making the trains run on time and giving you time back in your day is something nobody else is doing for. Because I want you to take the next call, the next time I ring on the phone, even if we had a great conversation last time, if I take you 15 minutes over, there's a good chance I've screwed up your whole day. So, and you're going to remember that. Even if the conversation was great, the last impression is the lasting impression. Those last 15 minutes while I'm messing up your day, you're checking your watch, you're checking with your assistants, you're trying to figure out what you got to move back. I mean, it's a mess for you. If I get off five minutes early, you're like, hey, look at this. You know, I, I, can, I can check my Instagram. I, you know, I can go get a cup of coffee. You're delighted with me all along. So I'm very conscious of how we manage time to begin with. If I'm going to ask for, if I'm going to ask you for 30 seconds, I'm going to be done in 20. Typically, what uh, what we coach people to do is, if you need 15 minutes, ask for 18. Odd number. People pay attention to that. I'm going to be done in 15. If I need five, I'm going to ask for seven. So I'm going to manage time very carefully in the call, so that no matter what, no matter what, you are always delighted with. Me. That way. When I drop the F bomb in a little while, if I'm planning on dropping it, then even if I meant it with all sincerity, if I've taken them out of that time frame, I'm the one who's being unfair. And they're never going to know the fair is such an emotional word that you've got to be really, really cautious with it at all times. Because the minute somebody feels like you called them unfair or made them feel that somehow they were unfair, what it means is they're probably not taking the next call. Mm. I love that. And when you said uh, manipulation of the perception, that was brilliant. The, um, w when it comes to, let's stick on airlines, because I get excited about stuff like this. Um, but but if we stick on the airlines and we think of low stakes environments where you can use all the skills that you use so yeah we can use them in cold calls yeah we can use them when we're buying a second-hand car and negotiating brilliant what are some of the low stakes games that you can play and if we stick on the theme of airlines when we had your son on the podcast we were talking about asking for upgrades so if someone's listening to this and they're like you know what i'm getting a flight to las vegas next week i want to put mr voss into action how would they do that? Well, yeah, and, and Brandon, you know, he, he had one of the, invented the most uh, sort of this methodology on upgrades if they're there. Because I'm, you know, back when I was teaching at USC, and every now and then <clears throat> he'd fly out and co-teach with me. He co-taught with me at every university I was ever at. And I, he's in Maryland, I'm in L.A., and he calls me one day and he's like, hey, look, just want you to know I missed my flight. I'm coming in on a lot later flight. And he sounds really upbeat and actually really proud of himself. And I'm like, you know, what, what, where is this coming from? You missed a flight. Like, how are you happy that you missed a flight? So I, I don't know if he told you this story. He shows up at the airline 
and it, you you got a problem at the counter, or even if you got an ask, empathy is about understanding what the other side sees, situationally aware. Airline personnel are are being hit, slammed on a regular basis with selfish, self centered people that are blaming the airlines for them being late to the to the to the airport and self effacing humor. So he's late. He's going to miss his flight. He's one of these dudes who, you know, he carries on. He wants to show up 10 minutes before a plane takes off. You know, time is money with him. And he <laughs> counts it in the airport, especially. And I think what he told me, he said, was, I'm here to sign up for the Stupid Customer of the Day Award. And because what's a person think? Like, you're an idiot. You 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 got a clock just like everybody else. You know how long it took to, to get here. Don't blame me because you can't show up at the airport on time. You might be the dumbest person I ran across all day. So he's thinking this through. What do they say to themselves? How do we make it fun? You know, I'm here to sign up for the stupid customer of the day award. And he says, this lady just kind of laughs and she finishes typing and she goes, okay, what do you got? Like the people behind the counter at the airport, they have so much power, so much influence on changing your seats around and making changes. You know, never be mean to somebody could hurt you by doing nothing. Well, the flip side of that is, if you treat the person across the table from you right, it's shocking what they can do for you if they feel like it. And she kind of laughs and he, and she says, all right, what is it? You know, I'm the idiot that missed my flight. And, uh, you know, I, I want to get on another plane. I don't want to have a, I don't want to step down in class and I don't want to be charged airline fees. And I'm just a selfish idiot because what are all those ass make you sound like? You know, not what is it in reality, not what is it to you, what does it sound like to the other side? That's empathy. And she kind of laughs and she puts him on another flight because they got the seat. She chooses not to charge him any fees. She puts him in the same class of service. And then when she gives Prince out a new ticket for him and she said, ah, don't be late next time. I might not be here when you come back. And he's got time. He goes home and he cuts the grass at his house. And he turns around and comes to the airport again. He's just proud of himself like crazy. So the airline people, what does it look like to them? When you walk up with your ass, what are they saying to themselves? And if you can articulate that, especially in a playful manner, what they will do for you is amazing. What, what is the, the neuroscience behind that? Because that's come up a few times in terms of people prefer to hear things from their perspective than be, but then your perspective be pushed on them. What, what's the neuroscience behind that? Well, first of all, <clears throat> what's going to go through their mind and how are you helping them think? This playfulness is a superpower. You know, uh, the late night FM DJ boy is a different kind of a superpower. Now, that's calming and soothing. It doesn't actually help you think. As a matter of fact, while I'm calming you down, I'm slowing your brain down. Now, if you're in a, uh, it's a rock, paper, scissors approach to emotional intelligence. If you're angry, i got to calm you down first. It's very difficult for me to take you from anger to playfulness or positivity, upbeat, curiosity, delight. I got to calm your anger first before I can jump you into that higher threshold. So where are you at when I approach? Now, you're 31% smarter in a positive frame of mind. So if I can get you to be playful, if I can get you to respond to any sort of positivity, you're going to be more mentally agile and more capable of thinking up better ideas with me. Now, I'm also going to be smarter in a positive frame of mind. So when I'm playful and emotions have a contagion, we both get smarter together. I'm also less of a threat. One of the first moves in any negotiation, in any ask is to take, eliminate yourself as a threat. You don't want to be threatening them because they can't think as well. Even if they want to help you, they're less capable of thinking. And I need you in a positive frame of mind. I need the person behind the counter to go like, oh, I can fix that. Instead of, you're just another jerk that walked in here and it's going to take effort for me to look at my computer and search this stuff out. I just don't feel like doing it. I want you to feel like helping me. So the whole idea of 
where where you're at emotionally to begin with i need to get you to the maximum i may not be able to take you straight there i may have to take a detour to calm your anger down before i get you up to uh, to a place where you're more inclined to collaborate nice nice okay and then <clears throat> let's let, let, let's stick on that but maybe a slightly different uh tax like different technique so if you're information gathering you've asked a great question and your counterpart is is really opening up and they're sharing information and you want to keep them on that area and you want to employ mirroring as a technique what parts of the conversation am i jotting down on my notepad and saying that's an area to mirror come back to that we're going to mirror this part how do we know what's the right mirror and when's the right time to use it all right and there's a sequence here too and i really like the way that you described it because if you ask a great question, it probably starts with the words what or how. And each one of those has a specific design. The word what is designed primarily to uncover problems. What's the biggest challenge you face? What gets in our way? What happened the last time you tried this? Not exclusively, but primarily to uncover problems. How? The word how is not exclusively, but primarily to uncover answers, implementation, the path ahead. How do you want to proceed? How are we going to overcome that obstacle? How are we going to know if we're on track? It's primarily implementation, the path ahead, uncovering, uh, uh, dealing with the problems that you've uncovered with the what. Now, here's a caveat. It takes a lot of mental energy to answer either one of those questions, the stop you in your tracks question. And that's what I like very much about you following that up with mirrors, because mirrors don't take energy to respond to the same way that a what or how question sucks the wattage out of somebody's head. Mirrors are easy to respond to, whether somebody's tired or whether or not they got a lot of mental wattage still left in their brain. Now, a mirror is just repeating one to three-ish words. As a hostage negotiator, we were taught to, for it to be the last one to three-ish words. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can die, you can jump all around. And you can go back to stuff. What do you mirror? What are you curious about? Mirror is something you're confused about. Mirror is something that you know is on the right path and you want to guide them in that particular direction. The mirror is this great skill that you can move all over the place. If you want to say to somebody, what did you mean by that? The mirror is much better because what did you mean by that is a what? And it drains people a little more quickly. When I don't know why, I just know it doesn't. A mirror doesn't drain. Them. How do I know which mirrors? You know, I don't, I don't really got to keep track of them. Um, I will let my curiosity guide me. If there's, and the chances are there's going to be three or four that I'm going to hear. I'm going to try to remember the most interesting one. Or if it suddenly occurs to me there was something that I failed to mirror earlier, I might say, you said a little while ago, the first problem you had? Back when they said, well, the first problem we had was this, and blah, 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 then they go on. So I can, I can take them back to that, that, that phrase and I can mirror it again if, if I realize that I missed it before. <laughs> Excuse me. The, w w when, we, when we bring people in and we teach them mirroring for the first time, we'll, we'll get them to talk about something and then we'll mirror them and, and they won't realize what we're doing and they're like, oh, right, okay, the penny clicks. So th they love it as a concept, but especially – people that are new to, to these skills and communicating, there's a lot of fear. And I think it's a mindset thing that they're going to mirror and they'll, they'll mirror you and go the first problem you had. And it, it does depend on what they say. And they think people are going to go, yeah. And they're just going to deadpan, shut them down. So, so how can, how can you mirror effectively and how can you, bringing the power of silence to make the two of them really beneficial together. Yeah, getting yourself a comfortable with silence is uh, what you have to be prepared for as you're learning the mirrors. Now, two out of three people on Earth have trouble with silence for very different reasons. 
you know, I'm sure the people on my team have said that we believe very strongly that there are three types of uh, negotiators in the world, uh, how we approach conflict, how we negotiate. It's fight, flight, make friends, the assertive, the analyst, and the accommodator. And each one is wired very differently, but the assertive has trouble shutting up because they want to talk. They feel out of control. If I'm not talking, I'm out of control. The accommodator feels out of control for other reasons. The accommodator believes in uh, positive communication. And the meanest thing that accommodator can do to you, the relationship oriented person is give you the silent truth. So when the assertive feels like they're losing control, the uh, accommodator, when they go silent, they feel like they're signaling anger. Mm-hmm. Since being the meanest thing I could do to you is to stop talking and give you the silent treatment. Then if I'm not talking, you're going to think I'm upset and angry, and I can't allow that to happen. <laughs> so there's, you know, there's two different types of panic over the same thing, silence. Now, the analyst loves silence. The analyst actually feels closer to you, feels an intimacy in silence. And you can imagine the accommodator and the analyst, you know, talking to each other. The accommodator is like, oh, my God, he's gone silent. He's angry with me. And the analyst is like, would this person just shut up? I got to think. I mean, it's, it's, almost, it's almost a comedy sketch and the, the different interpretations of the silence. So understanding, first of all, what horrifies you about silence probably gives you an indicator of what your type is. Now, secondly, getting comfortable in the silence in any event if your counterpart is an assertive and you go silent, they're going to talk some more and it's going to give you great information. The analyst, when they go silent, and quite possibly the analyst is the one who's just going to go, yes, and stare at you. But they love that intervening moment. And if you can stay silent with them, they'll actually feel closer to you. Give them a chance to open up. So what do you do when you go silent? Practice counting thousands to yourself. Be willing to at least go to three. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand. You're going to have trouble finding anybody that's going to keep quiet for longer than that. You're, if you're uncomfortable with silence, you ain't going to get to one, one thousand. You're going to freak out. <laughs> when, in fact, the other side was just thinking. And as an assertive, I, I have trouble going silent frequently on, on uh, this. We have a social media show, if you will, on this app called Fireside. What it is, mm-hmm. is it's, it's live coaching. In point of fact, other people have shows. We have guests we interview, and then people get to do a Q&A. It's live coaching. And I'm having trouble keeping my mouth shut because I got Camille Vasquez. Camille is the attorney that won the Johnny Depp defamation lawsuit. She was Johnny Depp's attorney and she kind of chopped Amber Heard up in court and Depp won the defamation case. Camille's fascinating. I mean, brilliant, great negotiator, delightful. Like, I got to tell you something. She's one of those attorneys. If she's on the other side of the table, you better settle because she's going to win. And I'm interviewing her and she's so fascinating. I ask her a question and she's thinking and I'm jumping in. And I'm, you know, and I keep interrupting her thought pattern. I tell myself, look, Camille's going to give you a great answer if you'll just shut up. And after I talked over it twice in a row, I'm like, okay, give Camille a chance to think. She's going to give me a really thoughtful answer. You marry somebody and they just go, yes. Count thousands. At about three or four, they're going to add something in. You get to nine, read the body. Are they staring at you or are they thinking? If they're thinking, let it go. If they're staring at you, what are the the possibilities? You have it in their trust. They're still thinking about it. You made them angry. You can say, I can't tell if I made you angry or if I just had them in your trust. What you're doing is you're throwing out an observation. Letting them know, though, that still you're very dialed into them. Elon Musk getting interviewed on the Lex Friedman podcast. 
Let's ask Elon a question. And Elon sat there for a full 22 seconds. So you count thousands and you get to 22 before Elon opened his mouth. But he's thinking. So you, if somebody gives you a one word answer, listen with your eyes, gather data with your eyes, read the body language, give them a little bit of a time, then make an observation of the dynamic that you're seeing in the moment and make it in a soft, respectful tone of voice and you will break the ice. Beautiful. Beautiful. We had a body language expert on the other week who was saying about um, those exact moment that you're talking about there. She was saying she found that when she sits back and looks down at their feet, if their feet are starting to point towards the door, it's a sure sign that they're looking to, to get out. Something's uncomfortable about the situation they're in. But she's done all this research into it's not always the obvious things. And if they start kind of playing with their hands and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's really interesting. We, we, we love this stuff. Um, so the, the next thing I wanted to, to ask you about was um, how to spot liars. So obviously you've done that in really high stakes environments. You've got to see, is this a bluff? Do I need to call it out? And then for us, much less stakes when we're in boardrooms with CEOs or negotiating deals. So how are we spotting those moments where ah, that's not that's not really what you meant? I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to spot those lies, those those little stories that aren't adding up. What are the giveaways? Well, um, <clears throat> so first of all, you got to separate your fear center, your amygdala from your gut. Like your gut is really good at spotting liars, and your fear your fear segment uh, centers in your brain will take over and tell you they're lying in the night. Um, or if you're offended, like as as um, as an assertive, the more direct and more concise somebody is, the more that correlates with honest. Now I'm choosing my words carefully, and the word that I'm choosing carefully is correlate. And so the more direct someone is, the more concise they are, the more it correlates with honesty, especially if it, if I'm an assertive. If I tell you the truth and you're not smart enough to figure it out, I'm going to give you a vibe like you're an idiot. Now, you're going to be offended by that. And instead of realizing I'm telling you the truth, you're going to, ah, well, you're lying to me. You know, it's a defensive reaction to an assertion. So sorting that out. Now, if somebody tells the truth, to tell the truth one way. So I'm going to get you talking. I'm going to try to develop, uh, my small talk is really about me developing a gun instinct for you. How long did it take you to get here today? You know, what you have for breakfast? Um, a lie detector asked you as a good polygrapher, and there are a lot of bad ones. But a good polygrapher is going to ask you a series of control questions to get a feel for what you look like when you're telling the truth. What day is it? What city are you in? What time is it? What you have for breakfast? If you tell the truth, and not everybody tells the truth, some people lie all the time. If you tell the truth, you tell the truth one way. Any deviation from that is a lie. There's so many tells to lie. It's impossible to keep up with them all. But I'm going to develop a few for you on how you tell the truth. I've done a couple of podcast interviews in the past. I don't particularly like playing this game. But they did, let's do two truths and a lie. And I'm like, all right, you know, whatever. You know, I, I find this uh, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to develop a feel for you in a longer period of time than the podcast. But in that case, I'm going to start peppering you with questions on each one of your stories. And if it's, uh, no, it's two lies and a truth, not two truths and a lie, right? I'm going to tell you two lies and, and you got to figure out of the third one, which one is the truth? <laughs> There's going to be a correlation between the two. Two of the stories are going to be similar, and your ability to come up with details, your similar ability to come up, uh, recall facts. And whichever one jumps out at me, very much like the, uh, the polygraph, I'm looking for what jumps out at me that's different. So I'm going to develop a gut instinct for you, and then I'm going to, I'm going to really kind of listen to my gut. One last thing is what and how questions which I said before, exhausting. 
the more I tire you out, the less likely you are is to make up nonsense to me about what's going to happen. A couple of years ago, we, pro- we got a project going. I'm doing a security project in another country. Subcontractor, the general contractor, is very threatened by my success in relationship with the client. Because I'm the sub, and they're the general. And the client likes us more than they like the general contractor. This whole graduation ceremony that I suspect that the general contractor is trying to keep me from because they don't want us celebrating with the client at the end of the training. And I don't know how to get there. And I want the general contractor to send a cab over. We're in the Middle East in another country where there ain't no street signs. And if you're not a local, you can't find your way around. And I say to him, all right, so how are we going to get there? He says, I'll send you a map. And then I thought and said, how are you going to get me the map? And he went dead son. He never intended to get me the map. He had one lie worked out, but he didn't have the corresponding lies to go with it. He never intended to perform. And when I just asked him another how question, which turned the wattage out of his head, you can always tell the truth because you don't got to make it up. It takes no effort. If you're lying, you got to make it up, and it takes effort, and people get drained by that. So if I pound you with what and how questions, you're going to run out of gas ultimately where I'm going to find out you're lying because you're just not going to have an answer. Do you find that so what and how questions in a boxing match are the jabs? And then sometimes on, on calls we find that a why question is like the ultimate knockout punch. That That just – if you ask somebody – why is it that way? It's just that their brain explodes. What, what's your relationship in negotiation with the, the word why? Well, the what and how question is a little bit more than jabs because, you know, a what or how question is probably a pretty good hook. I mean, it cracks somebody in the head pretty hard. You might not knock them out with it, but by the time you've hit them the third time with a what or how question, you're probably knocking them out, and you're not going to knock somebody out with three jabs. Now, the why question is a whole different ball of wax. Um, why it makes people feel accused, why it triggers defense mechanisms, why it tends to trigger anger. All of these negative emotions are draining and in many cases will cause a little bit of a downward spiral that doesn't help me overall. So I'm really leery of why questions. And to prove that to people when I'm in, in the training with them, and everybody asks why questions because Simon Sinek says, find out their why. You know, there's a whole methodology that says find out their why. Well, you do want to find out their why, but if you use the word why, it's a damaging defense-inducing word. And defense-inducing is generally not good for you for the long run. So uh, I'm teaching a a bunch of very senior executives just a couple of weeks ago. I mean, some heavy hitters in the mergers and acquisitions industry. People say, we negotiate all the time. We negotiate, you know, what are we going to learn from you? Not only do we negotiate all the time, but, you know, we're doing multi-million dollar deals on a regular basis. And no matter how good you are, you're not making the kind of deals we are. So I get, you know, I'm I'm looking around the room and I'm looking for a guy who looks like uh, he's not going to get rattled easily. And this one gentleman, pretty, pretty, a big Pretty big guy, uh, actually bigger than I realized when he was sitting down and passed him in the hall later. Like, oh, man, this dude is big. And he has got a jacket on. So I go, why aren't you wearing a jacket? And I tried to say it as nice and gently as I could. And he kind of goes, it's warm in here. And I go, all right, so I'm going to change that question. What caused you to not wear a jacket? I go, that felt differently. That landed differently didn't it? He goes, he goes like, yeah. And, and I said, now I can do it a third way and it's going to hit you even differently. It seems like you got a reason for not wearing that jacket. And she's, I said, that hit you completely different. You're actually much more likely to respond to me the quickest, the third one. He was like, yeah. And I looked around at the room and I said, now when I asked him why he didn't wear the jacket, internally he said to himself, what the fuck is it to you? And as soon as I said that, he said, that's exactly what I said to myself. <laughs> I'm like, oh man. I didn't plant this guy. He's playing right into it. And, you know, we laughed about it, but he really did, you know, uh, when, when he was going like, cause it's warm in here inside, he's giving me what the F is it to you, you jerk. 
And that's what you do if you're not careful with wine. I pass him in a hall later, and I and he's like, he's about two inches, three, four inches taller than I figured, and about 70 pounds heavier. I'm like, he's a monster. And I'm like, thank God that this guy was playful and he played along with me because you triggered defensiveness if you're not careful with the why. Wow. Amazing. Um, it's been amazing, Chris. I, one, one last question that we've been wanting to, to ask. Um, if you were to go back now and write Never Split the Difference, is there anything you would include that you didn't? Um, we're actually working on a supplemental book. I wouldn't change Never Split the Difference. Um, I, I would, if, if I was going to make any changes, you know, the book opens up, I'm, I'm pretty tough on Harvard. I'm pretty tough on some colleagues at Harvard. And I, I think I was a harder than was necessary on drawing the distinction between the Harvard thinking and Black Swan method. Other than that, we're working on uh, two people that work with me. Derek Gaunt and Jonathan Smith are working on the Tactical Empathy Operations Manual. With any luck, that'll be out in a year. It's a good companion book. Uh, and there's stuff that we've learned and we've added to our thinking that I think uh, in our in our um, negotiation newsletter, in our training, we're constantly giving people the cutting-edge stuff that we've got. I like Never Split the Difference the way it was written. Amazing. I like it a lot, too. We, we use the skills every day, and if you want to get a promotion within our company, there are three books, and, and that is one of the books that you must have read. Otherwise, you're out the door. You cannot i got to know the other two books. What are the other two books? <laughs> Uh, there are two, two sales books. So one of them is You Can't Teach a Kid to Ride a Bike at a Seminar by Sandler. And the second one is Gap Selling by a guy called Keenan. Um, oh, very good. It's all about, yeah, yeah, problem where future de design, future state. But those are the three books. There are Bibles when it comes to the world of sales. Um, Chris, we, we could talk to you all day. We might have to get you back on when the new book's out and dig deep into your mind again um if people want to work with you check you out where can they find you yeah subscribing to the newsletter is the best move the the, the newsletter is a gateway to the gold mine and our website is black swan ltd.com b-l-a-c-k-s-w-a-n-l-t-d.com when you go there there's a whole bunch of different offerings but you're going to get the opportunity to, to subscribe to the newsletter first it's complimentary it's concise and it's usable. It's actionable. You get an email on Tuesday morning. You get an actionable, actionable, concise, usable article. And you get notifications about where we're training, what we're doing, uh, new, new training products that we have. It, it's really a great way to keep up to speed. This Actually, this week as we speak, we, got, uh, we just started this year what we call our diamond training. It's two days of really intense immersion training. We're doing it in Philly right now. There'll be some other places that we do it. But if you subscribe to the newsletter, you find out about our training and you get something you can use every Tuesday. We'll include all the links. Make sure you sign up if you are listening. Thank you so much, Chris. Thanks, Thanks Chris. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Enjoy the conversation.